All right. So we've talked a little bit about the basics of that XPS technique, a surface characterization, composition characterization technique. Uh, but I also want to talk about another type of surface composition, uh, AES, which stands for OJ electron spectroscopy. I've already used that term, OJ electron, but we're going to look at the spectroscopy of that. And the reason I'm grouping these two together is because they require a lot of the same instrumentation and often are uh, obtained, both XBS and uh, OJ electron spectroscopy are obtained from the same instrument. And so that's why we're kind of grouping them together. But let's go through the basics of this OJ electron and, and where it comes from and how we use it to uh, determine composition. So again, you might remember a lot of this from EDS and the mechanism there, but let's kind of just again review. So we have an incident beam. In this case, it's an electron, but it could be x-rays. That is high enough energy to knock out an inner shell electron. And that would be our photo electron that we talked about uh, here. And we know that there's a vacancy here now. And there's a going to be a tendency for an outer shell electron to fill this inner shell. In, able, in order to um, uh, reach a, a lower state, because we're at an excited state. And when that electron goes into the inner shell from the outer shell, uh, the difference in energy is um, released in the form of an x-ray. So this is our characteristic x-ray that we used in EDS, right? All right, but we're not done with that story yet, though because this X characteristic X-ray can simply escape and you know be used for EDS, has a uh, specific value tied to the difference between these two shells, but uh, it can also, if it has a high enough energy, it can actually knock out uh, another electron in an atom uh, on kind of on its way out of the sample. Um, it has to have high enough energy to do so. So this uh, X-ray can basically knock out another electron. So basically we have like a secondary effect and that electron that's being knocked out is OJ electron. So these have very low energy and are therefore only able to escape from very um, small regions of the surface. And that's why we can use them as a surface technique. So we're still looking at electron, but the process to get it is more elaborate, right? It's produced from the characteristic X-ray. So if we wanna use this electron to characterize where it's coming from, right? Because that's what we're kind of after here is composition. And so if I want to be able to say this is from copper or carbon or whatever other element, um, I need to have something specific to that element. And so what we do is we're able to uh, determine uh, in uh, OJ electron spectroscopy what the characteristic, or sorry, what the kinetic energy of the electron, uh, this electron is, right? It goes through the detector, we can measure uh, the kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is going to be tied to the relative binding energies of these various shells. So this is our kinetic energy for the OJ electron. And you see here that we're calling it the KL1, L2, 3, because those are the various shells, right? Initially K, uh, and then... Um, L1, so that was this transition, and then it knocks out an L23. So that's why we have three symbols here. And so this is the energy of that OJ electron is approximately equal to the binding energy of the K electron, so this one down here, minus the binding energy of the other two. So basically we can determine the energy of that electron by subtracting the higher electrons from the, the lower. 
And so in using that, uh, when we're looking at the spectrum here, we see, you know, again, this, in this case, it's O for oxygen, but it has the KLL. So it's basically going through this transition that we see. Same thing with, for this one, this is carbon, the KLL. So it's a similar transition to what we see here. So that is the OJ electron for those elements going through those transitions, and it has a specific binding energy or kinetic energy in that case. All right, so again though, um, for OJ electron spectroscopy or AES, uh, we typically look at kinetic energy of the electron, not binding. And so that's why we often see these spectrums in kinetic energy. So that's a big difference between those two. We can convert back and forth very easily, but it's if you see it presented in kinetic energy, we're talking about OJ electrons. And we can do the same thing. Uh, there are charts for, uh, charts and tables for the various um, kinetic energies of electrons and their various OJ electrons. So the KLL type transitions for all the elements can be found in this plot that we have. And we can tie those energy to the spectrum that we have for our material. And in doing that, we see that we have carbon, oxygen, and aluminum. And if we look at this, the oxygen is approximately, maybe a little higher than 500 in terms of uh, kinetic energy. And we see if we go down here just a little bit above 500, when we go up here, we see a dot, and that ties to oxygen. So all of these kind of match with the positions that we see. So again, we have a specific value for an OJ electron. We compare that to known values for the elements and their kinetic energies. All right, so one thing I should say here when we talk about OJ electrons is that the amount that we have is substantially lower than the number of secondary electrons that's generated. Again, those secondary electrons are ones that are emitted from, uh, from the incident. So here's just kind of a plot showing you this huge peak here is secondary electrons. And then just these tiny little uh, blips, oh, sorry about that, um, are uh, OJ electrons. So we have really low amounts. And so the, the background, the noise um, of the signal tends to be really large. And the background is actually uh, the primary electrons that have been you know, uh, inelastically scattered along the way. So because the values of those um, OJ electrons tend to be pretty small, um, so here you can kind of see the, the scale there, they're pretty small compared to the background here. So to kind of, kind of um, to show it in a, to be able to see the peaks a little easier, what we often do is convert the signal to a derivative. So we look at the derivative of a signal uh, and that kind of compensates for the low signal levels. And so you see here that I've highlighted, these are the derivatives of the peaks. And so you can see a little bit more pronounced where those, those happen. So it emphasizes the peaks more than in the direct mode. So when you look at a, AES, you often see this derivative mode used. So if you see peaks that look like this, where there's a peak and then a uh, positive and then a negative, um, then you're looking at the derivative mode. Um, and that's favored for quantification as well. But that's another sign that we're looking at AES. <coughs> All right. So similarly, I've got you um, an unknown element here, and this is AES uh, spectra, and you see all these various peaks. It, again, it's one element. So what I want you to do is uh, looking at uh, similar uh, data tables for AES, those energy values, see if you can obtain uh, what this element is. And uh, on this one, um, I have, I'll upload uh, the, the table that you saw in the previous um, page. So this table, I'll, I'll upload this table for you because I don't believe our book has values for, for this. <coughs> Excuse me. So using that table that's on Canvas, um, I'll put it in the miscellaneous files 
um, see if you can identify what this element is and uh, come back to the video and we will discuss the, the results. All right, so let's see what you've come up with. So again, um, there is a table in uh, the miscellaneous files. It's a surface character table. It has all the information you're gonna need for XPS and AES. Um, and so kind of inspecting that table versus what we have here, and they're giving you the values as 47, uh, 591, 598, uh, 651, 703. So based on all these values, let's see if we can determine what it is. Uh, so it ends up being iron, but let's take a look at how we got that. So I'm going to show you the, the table, a snippet from the table. And if we look at iron, and if I just draw a line for iron, we see that iron, you would expect to see this uh, peak up here, this one here, this one there, and this one here. So at, at least four peaks here. And let me just highlight the positions there of what they are. So this one, if you look down here, is pretty close to 50. Uh, this one is pretty close to, to 600. Uh, the, then the next one is close to 650, and then seven, a little over 700. Uh, and so that's you know the values that we see here. Um, we're not seeing this little tiny one here at, at 591. It's it's pretty small. It could be mixed in with this uh, 598. Um, it's, it's hard to tell from this, this plot, but, uh, you know, that, that's what we see in this range, uh, of, of values. So again, we're just mixing, or sorry, we're just comparing the values that we see, uh, to known values for, uh, different OJ electron transitions for different elements over here. And we try to find a match. All, that's all we're doing in spectroscopy. And so in this case, we get iron.